a president and a candidate for the presidency has never been criminally brought to trial. Who puts not one, but two lawyers on here? We could have someone who gets convicted, put in prison, and then becomes the president of the United States. A very important situation here with juror number 11, who had some very interesting things to say. I was stunned. Well, tonight we're talking about a highly unprecedented legal case. This affects all of us. A president and a candidate for the presidency has never been criminally brought to trial. Today was one for the history books. It marks the first time that a former president goes on trial for criminal charges. This is a giant witch hunt to try and earn a campaign that's beating the worst president in history. State felony charges filed last year in New York allege he falsified business records to cover up a hush money payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, trying to stop her from going public about an alleged affair just days before the 2016 presidential election. Paying hush money is not a crime. The DA is alleging that the records were falsified to cover up another crime that being election interference. And that's what makes the misdemeanor into felonies. Trump has pleaded not guilty to all charges. More than half of the first 96 jurors told the judge they couldn't be impartial. Very simple. Everything you heard about this is a witch hunt. The judge will work through lots and lots of jurors to find people who can express a genuine willingness to look at the facts of this case and judge the evidence that's presented by the prosecution. There's great significance to this trial because Donald Trump could be elected president again. If convicted, Trump could face up to four years in a New York state prison. I want to talk about the jury. And I want to talk about what I consider to be the forgotten jury. Because if you look across all the media, what you're hearing is this lawyer's arguing this, this lawyer's arguing that, here's what the judge is saying, this is what the law is, this is what the theories are. But you know what? This case is going to be problem solved by 12 Americans. 12 Americans that are gonna go into a room, they're going to sit down, and they're going to decide the fate of Donald Trump, current candidate for president of the United States. And how they problem solve that doesn't have to be a mystery. This is something that can be known. And I've spent a lot of my professional career doing just that kind of work. But let's talk about what is at stake here. If the verdict comes in guilty, against Donald Trump, what are the scenarios that we need to be considering? First, he faces up to four years in prison. I'm talking about how we get to that outcome and what the impact would be. If Donald Trump is convicted and faces four years in prison, the scenarios are these. If he were to win the election, and that could happen because you can be convicted of a felony and still be elected president and serve as president. You can't necessarily vote if you're a convicted felon from prison, but you can serve as president from prison. The inauguration would have to happen from prison. He would have to entertain heads of state from prison. He would have to have staff meetings in prison. He would have to actually do his job as president, maybe from Rikers Island in the beginning, then from some prison in New York. And one of the things that I'm very concerned about is that this jury seems to have been forgotten. Now, are jury consultants involved in this? There appears to be some help being rendered, but I can tell you in all the time that I did this, there was a much more active role than what appears to be happening right now because how jurors problem solve these things, how they get to a verdict is a, a very active and ongoing process. And here's what I mean by that. There might be a thousand facts in this case. 
But out of that thousand facts, there might be 10, 12, or 15 that in a proper configuration are going to be what determines how the jury comes down on this case. What are those 10 or 12 facts? How are they needing to be presented? What does the jury need to understand in order to come to a clear decision on this case? That may change across time. That jury needs to be monitored. You need to find out how they're understanding this case. What do they need to understand about this case to come down to a clear and concise verdict? So let me just talk about what would normally be done in a very important case like this. Research would be done on who should be on a jury like this by either side. It could be the prosecution or the defense to find out what kind of juror, specific juror, is most likely to understand your case, resonate with what you're presenting, and view your case most favorably. Now, both sides are able to do this, and that's important in profiling who you're trying to keep on your jury. So how do you do that? One of the ways is to conduct mock trials. And the way you do that is to actually find out what the demographic is in the venue you're going to be in. Do they tend to be older, younger? Do they tend to be highly educated, lesser educated? What is it that defines the people that you're ultimately gonna be trying it to? We typically brought in 50 or more people and would have multiple deliberation rooms and we would mock try the case. We would have someone put on the side that we weren't representing, and then our lawyers would put on their side. And we would vigorously, aggressively represent the other side. We videotaped those deliberations, and we analyzed them very, very carefully to see what mattered to them, see what it was that we talked about that they talked about in the deliberation rooms, what path they followed to get to a verdict, if we put on experts that really were important to them to get their opinion, then we knew that was important at trial. We also looked to see which jurors liked the case and which ones didn't. You know, sometimes you would find out that this kind of juror, maybe it was a male that had a college degree, was a Baptist, had 2.2 kids and a barking dog, just didn't like your case time after time after time and you didn't know why, but you knew that that person just didn't like the case, and you never figured out why, but they just never did, then you knew that was someone you wanted to take off of the jury panel with your strikes. We figured that out, and it was so important. You don't pick a jury. You deselect a jury. A panel of, of potentials come in, and you don't get to pick who you want, you get to choose who you want to take off the panel. And you have a certain number of strikes, and so you take off those people that you think are most dangerous for your case. Hopefully, if there's somebody that has a, a preconceived notion against your side of the case, if you're the prosecution, then you, you point that out to the judge and the judge will strike them for cause then you have a certain number of peremptory strikes where you can say, I want to take this person off. You don't have to have a reason. You just say, I want to take them off. And then you're left with whoever you're left with. And once we know who the jury is, whether it's seven men and five women, then we say, okay, who are they? Who are these people? What's their education, their age, their background? We would often hire people of that same description and put them in the gallery to watch the case. We called it a mirror jury. Then we would have the opportunity to debrief those people at the end of the day and find out where they were after hearing that day's testimony. We could find out where we were in the case along the way. All the focus was on the jury because the jury is the critical element once the case starts. Everything depends on the jury and someone was there to watch the jury the entire time to see, are they making eye contact? Are they nodding along with the lawyers? Are they paying attention? Which jurors are connecting with each other? Which jurors are going to lunch with each other? Which jurors 
are staying away from other jurors? Is there a leader emerging in the group? All of those things were very important in the dynamics of a trial. I can tell you at the end of the trial, there will be closing arguments. Each side's lawyer will stand up and give a closing argument. But the real closing argument happens in the jury room. Somebody on that panel is a leader. And when they go in there to deliberate, that person will stand up and say, okay, here's the deal as I see it. And that person will have bonded with those jurors and that person will make the most powerful speech during the whole trial. It will be one of the jurors that will make a closing argument inside that jury room. It was our job to find out who that person was and make sure that that lawyer connected with that juror and gave them the tools they needed. All of these things go on inside a trial. Doesn't seem to be happening right now for either side, but it certainly should. And that's why I say this show is about the forgotten jury. It wasn't until almost 12 years after the affair allegedly occurred that the world first learned of the allegations of hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. In the weeks before the 2016 election, Donald Trump had arranged a $130,000 payment to the adult film star to keep her from publicly discussing their alleged 2006 encounter. Later, former Trump attorney Michael Cohen testified that Trump directed him to make payments to Daniels, quote, for the principal purpose of influencing the election, and that Trump later reimbursed him. How credible a witness would Daniels be? She seems like she would make a very good witness. If I were trying the case, I'd be happy to put her on the stand. What really helps the prosecution here is what she is talking about is all corroborated in the documents. Well, joining me tonight is former L.A. prosecutor and News on Merritt Street anchor Lonnie Coombs. Lonnie, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This is a big case, right? This is Huge. unprecedented. It's unprecedented for two reasons. One, it's historical because we've never had a United States president be tried in a criminal trial after they've left office. But it also has ramifications for the future because he is a presumptive presidential nominee. So we could have someone who gets convicted put in prison, and then becomes the president of the United States. What does that mean for all of us? Yeah, and people would say, well, that's not going to happen. He's going to appeal and all of this. Well, that may be, yeah. but I mean, come on. He could wind up in prison and have to serve from there if this happens. That's exactly right. Yeah, so we have to consider those possibilities. So let's talk about the jury. We put a title on this show, The Forgotten Jury. Yeah, the media's not talking about them. Now, the judge has said, we don't want to disclose anything about the, the jury. And they, they do have an entitlement to privacy here. We don't want to do anything to identify the jurors and put them in jeopardy of harassment or worse. That's not, it. That's not what we want to do. We want to talk about them in terms of who they are demographically. I want people to have some insight into how jurors are impaneled. And first off, I want to talk about the fact that you don't really pick a jury. We always talk about we're going down to pick a jury. <laughs> we wish we picked a jury. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah. But actually, the jury is deselected. That's right. Essentially, it's random where the judge will call out the numbers or the names, however they do it. They put them in the box. They're there. They're jurors, unless either the judge or one of the attorneys then pulls them off that jury. Yeah, and in this case, I think they called in, what, 100 jurors to start with. There's a big pool of jurors. Yes. And there was a very uncommon number dismissed for cause. That's Talk right. about cause. So 96 jurors were called in at the very beginning, and the judge just said right off the bat, do any of you feel, declare for yourselves, you cannot be fair and impartial in this case, once they found out what the case was. And about 50% of them just immediately said, we can't do it. In this case, the judge automatically said, okay, you're all off. He struck them for cause. For cause is when a juror cannot be fair or impartial, and the judge takes care of it. The attorneys don't have to use their challenges to do it. In most cases, as we know, the judge, if you say, self-declare, I can't be fair or impartial, they'll call that juror up and do a little interview. The attorneys can be there, the judge can listen, and they will decide if it's true or not. In this case, the judge decided ahead of time, he told the attorneys, we're not even gonna worry about the interviews. If they self-declare, we're just gonna let them go. Right. 
And there can be other reasons for cause, like somebody's got surgery scheduled right. or there's just a conflict. They can right. get out Medical for that. Medical conditions, yeah. work schedules. There are reasons that they can't serve, and so they, they get off for that. And a lot of times people think, well, if there's a conflict of interest, like they know somebody on the trial team or they've just heard about the case, but that's not it. That's not the test. The test is, can you set that aside and follow the instructions of the judge when he gives them. You could know somebody, right. and if you can convince the judge I can be fair and impartial, you could serve. That's right, and the judge even said ahead of time in this case, look, it's not gonna be a matter if the juror likes or dislikes somebody, because in this case, a lot of people have very strong feelings about Mr. Trump, so we can't let that be the basis. It literally is, regardless of their feelings, can they put them aside and say that they're gonna be fair and impartial? And as you know, Dr. Phil, that is literally a sort of a tag phrase that the judge is looking for. And they can say some outrageous things ahead of time, but if they can come around to the end, but I can put that aside and be fair and impartial, then a lot of times the judge will say, okay, I'm not gonna take up for cause. It'll be up to the attorneys to have to use a preemptory challenge. Yeah, and sometimes that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, uh, they said the judge released one juror who said some pretty outrageous things. And the judge finally said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll let him go instead of making the defense burn a, a challenge. We have a graphic that I want people to see about prospective jurors. And you're going to go through a minimum of 38 in this case, right? Because you're gonna seat 12. Mm -hmm. That's what we see in the blue. You're gonna seat six alternates. And then each side has 10 strikes. So if there aren't any more that come up for cause, and of course there are, but if there aren't, you're gonna go through at least 38. Yes, and actually in this case, each of the alternates, each side got two more preemptory challenges, right. so even more. Yeah. yeah, so getting into your picking, you have to look deeper into the panel than just the ones that you're going to be seating. So you go through a lot of people. You do, you um, do. Were you surprised that they seated this jury as fast as they did? I was surprised. I was especially surprised when after the second day we came back, they'd seated seven jurors. One of them said, I'm nervous about my privacy and I don't feel because of that pressure I can be impartial. And then the other one, the attorneys found something in his background that they decided they were gonna strike him off. I thought that there were gonna be a lot more people coming back and saying, I slept on it, I'm nervous about this, I don't wanna be on it. Uh, but they got through it quickly. I think everybody was surprised by how quick it was. Yes, I, I certainly was. I want to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to look at who actually wound up impaneled on this jury, because I was stunned at some of the people that made it onto the jury. It really makes me wonder who they struck. Two jurors were dismissed after being seated and sworn in. The first, a nurse from Manhattan who said that she was concerned about identifying information about her uh, making its way to the media. Then, later in the day, a second juror was dismissed. Prosecutors raised questions about whether he had honestly answered a question about having in the past been accused or convicted of a crime. The judge, in light of what has happened to these two jurors, has ordered the media to stop reporting the specific names of Potential jurors, the parties have the names, uh, Donald Trump has the names, but the rest of the world does not know who these people are. I'm back, and again, I have Lonnie Coombs here, uh, anchor for Merritt Street Media and former prosecutor for the LA District Attorney. And Lonnie, you've been involved in impaneling many juries, yes, uh, as have I from a trial science standpoint. I was very surprised who made it onto this jury, were you? Absolutely, yes. Well, let's take a look at who we actually got on the jury. Now, the four person, by the way, in New York courts, it's just the first person that's impaneled. They don't get elected or anything, they're just the first person. And even that I thought was interesting because usually in juries, the jury together picks the four person. Right. But here it's just random. Yeah, so here we have a male, works in sales, but let's go down to juror number seven. Male, civil litigator, white shoe firm, likely Trump administration policies he disagrees with. Now, talk about putting a lawyer on the panel. Well, the hard and fast rule is you never put a lawyer on the panel. You're told when you're in law school, you're never gonna be on a jury. Nobody's gonna ever want you because immediately everyone else looks to you as you're the expert, you know the law, and essentially whatever you say, most likely the rest of the jurors are going to listen to. So neither side of the attorneys want to risk 
everything being in the hands of that one juror. Yeah, because you could be trying your case to one person, That's essentially. Right. That's right. And if that person is charismatic, nice, if they're, if he or she is, is a really approachable person and not arrogant and all, they truly could control the entire process. That's right. And I, I said at the beginning of this show that oftentimes the closing argument, the real closing argument takes place inside the jury room. I have yeah. debriefed so many yeah. juries after a verdict and they say, well, you know, we kind of were feeling this way or that, but we got in there and Carol or Jeff stood up and said, okay, I've really paid attention to this, and let me tell you what I, th and they did a closing argument yes. that carried the day. I've had jurors come up and tell me what they argued in the jury room, and I was like, that's a great argument. I wish I'd made that in my closing argument. Yeah. I had two young women jurors come up to me afterwards, and they said, you would have been so proud of us. We were making your arguments for you in the jury room, and everybody yeah. listened to us. I was like, there you go. Yeah, they are making and, their and, so, argument. and that's so important. And that's why I'm saying I feel like this jury has been forgotten. And who puts not one, but two lawyers on here? This number corporate three. lawyer, jury number three. We have seven and three on here, worked at two major white shoe law firms. Now, both of these are Manhattan law firms. And... We know from some research that's been done that looked into what amicus briefs have been filed with the Supreme Court from New York law firms, they tend to be liberal. Hmm. And so if we use that just as an indicator, then will these guys be willing to go back to their law firms and say, I was a driver on a jury that acquitted Donald Trump because we know Manhattan is a very liberal venue. When you study it up close, there is not a neighborhood, block, or street that is not Democratic. Well, and also looking at the prosecution case, the theory in this case, I would think that lawyers would be really good at going through it. It's a hard theory for jurors to understand, and jurors might just say it's too convoluted, but these lawyers, because they're trained as lawyers, they're trained to look at legal theory, it seems to me that they could be helpful to the prosecution in the jury room. They could. It could cut the other way. If this case is stretched, and really a giant step to bring these misdemeanor charges up to a class E felony, mm -hmm. they could see through that and say, hey, you know, they're talking about influencing an election. Isn't that what a candidate is supposed to do? Right. Uh, I mean, they could say, I, I think this is a leap you can't take. It could cut both ways. That's exactly. the whole problem. It's a problem for That's both right. sides. Because neither side knows, right? There are a lot of little legal details that the defense can really argue, and they would be uh, aligned to it. They would listen to it and pay attention to it. So you really don't know which way they can go. Yeah, and, and which is a risk you don't want to take in such a big case. Now, there's also a very important situation here with juror number 11 who had some very interesting things to say. Donald Trump wasn't required to be in court doing his civil trial, having to deal with the New York Attorney General or the one with the sexual assault, having to deal with E. Jean Carroll. But in a criminal trial, he is required to be present every day of the court proceedings. With jurors in that courtroom, they are going to be watching every single move that he makes. I was staying a lawyer and marked it down as an illegal expense. He'll be able to talk outside of the courtroom, of course, but he has to remember, anything he says can be used against him in that courtroom. A Dr. Phil two-part special continues. The state of New York versus Donald Trump. We have a jury, and we have little information about these people that are on the jury. Do you feel, with that limited knowledge that we have of them, that Trump will get a fair trial? No, I don't. That's probably as good as you can get out of a jury pool of 85% voters against Trump. But it's not a good jury. 
there are two lawyers, at least on the jury, so maybe they will engage in some kind of legal analysis. But in general, I don't trust this jury to give a fair trial. Well, I'm back with former prosecutor and Merritt Street Media anchor Lonnie Coombs, and we're talking about the makeup of the jury in New York State versus Donald Trump. I want to talk a little about juror number 11. This is a female product development manager, and important that it's a manager, somebody that's used to being a boss. Right. And she does not like Trump's persona. In fact, she said, he just seems very selfish and self-serving. Well, I don't really appreciate that in any public servant, so I don't know him as a person, so I don't know how he is in terms of his integrity. And then she added, it's just not my cup of tea. This looks to me like a juror that got on when lawyers were out of strikes. Right. Right. It's always interesting. Like you said, when we were talking about the jurors on there, who did they already strike off so that they got stuck with the lawyers, right? I'm sure they weren't necessarily intending to end up with the lawyers. Now, this juror did go on to say, she gave an example of, I may not like my coworker, but it doesn't mean I won't listen to their opinions. And I think I can be fair and impartial. Once again, going to that catchphrase that we know the judge is listening for. If she said she can try and be fair and impartial, then they leave it up usually to the attorneys to try and strike them. Yeah, wouldn't be my first choice. And again, Dr. Phil, you talked about, you know, how important it is that she's a manager. When I was picking my jury, I would also rate the jurors as either a follower or a leader because you want to keep the eye on the people you think are going to be leaders. Are they going to be strong for you or against you? The followers you can kind of not worry quite as much about, but yeah. manager, attorneys, those are, those are leaders. Yeah, they certainly are. We've got a female here that's a teacher in the charter school system, raised her hand when asked if she had heard of other criminal cases. We've got a physical therapist here, a security engineer, and we've got a female that says she has opinions about Trump but can set them aside. So this, to me, when I step back and look at it as a whole, this is a pretty educated jury. And I always say you, you've got 12 personalities here. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the collective personality. So that's the 13th personality. And then how are you going to have small groups and cliques? I, I, you always wanna know who's going to lunch together, who starts riding to the courthouse together, yeah. uh, who's taking breaks together, putting their heads together. Uh, how are these lawyers going to to bond, and they always say, please don't discuss the case until it's over. I don't know how many cases I've done in all these years. I don't know one that I believe they didn't discuss the case until it was over. Yeah, you see the clicks, but you also worry about if there's a loner that's staying by himself and you're just like, oh, what's happening with that person? Why is he not getting along with the rest of the jury, right? Yeah, there are just so many factors here. And it seems to me somebody needs to be paying attention to this every step of the way. Yep. And it's what I did, and I know it's very busy. And oftentimes we had an entire team in the courtroom working on this. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. A jury was just seated for the first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president. This is a very savvy jury pool and jury that emerged. It's very unusual to have an anonymous jury. That happened during Watergate at some of the big trials. They were sequestered juries. So it's got to be certain stress levels that are they're not used to. A Dr. Phil two-part special continues. The state of New York versus Donald Trump. The real problem with this case is the law. Uh, there's just no crime here. The prosecutors just made up a crime. They took a state misdemeanor that was barred by the statute of limitations and turned it into a felony by invoking an unnamed federal statute that uh, they have no jurisdiction over. This has all the prescriptions for a very, very unfair trial. I've got a question for you as a former prosecutor. Mm -hmm. When Bragg was campaigning, 
he said, and I quote, I promise I'm going to, quote, get Trump. I mean, that was one of his big campaign cornerstones. Mm -hmm. The ABA standard 3-1.2 reads, the primary duty of the prosecutor is to seek justice within the bounds of the law, not merely to convict. Yes. How do you square those two things if you're a prosecutor? So I, I want to tell you, as a prosecutor, I feel very strongly that that is our mission and our duty. We are to seek justice. We aren't to go after conviction. So anytime, you know, you have prosecutors bragging about their conviction rate, I'm like, but that's not our goal as prosecutors. We're supposed to seek justice. And sometimes justice means not filing a case, dismissing a case. That's what justice is in that case. So when you hear Bragg saying, I'm going to get Trump, what are you basing that on? Do you even know the case yet? And what's interesting is in the timeline, when you see after he does take office and he starts to get into the investigation, all of a sudden he starts to express that he's not certain about the investigation. He's not certain if there's a case there or not. So I think he was inappropriate and uh, you know it was a political statement that he was making to try and, and win the election, but not one that a prosecutor should be saying if they take the mission seriously that you're supposed to seek justice. You shouldn't say that unless you know the case. He didn't even know the case. And even at that point, you're not trying to get somebody. You're just trying to make sure that the, the evidence is there. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. You let the jury decide what justice is. But if you're into a case, you're arguing a case, you're pushing a case, and in that process, say, there's there's no meat on this bone. There's mm -hmm. nothing here. Is, is it your duty to drop it, to move on, to let it go? Yes, it is. It is. You're, you, you decide you are the first line of justice, essentially. The prosecutor is supposed to say, is there enough evidence here to charge the case? And if there isn't, you don't charge it. You can say, investigators, go back and investigate some more. If you want to try and bring it to me again and you bring more evidence, then I'll look at it again. But if you bring me a case and I don't think there's enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, you don't just throw it up on the wall and say, oh, I'll let the jury decide. It is your duty right there and then to not charge the case. It just seemed to me that this, this was kind of preordained if he's making these campaign promises because it was under a lot of criticism and pressure that he moved forward with this. And again, I'm not advocating for Trump or not. I'm just saying I'm looking at how this got to be. And there are a lot of, of, of critics that say the case doesn't hang together, that there's not, there's not a basis for this, that it's an overreach, prosecutorial abuse. And I'm wondering if he had just written checks he feels like now he has to make good on. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a question that gets raised because of that, which is why he should never have said it. it. It hurts his credibility in making the final decision because you wonder what it was motivated by. Well, there, there's a lot on both sides of this case that people have problems with. Uh, one of the things I've got a problem with are some of the things that were in a questionnaire that was given out to the jury. It was multi-pages. Most of it was just kind of standard, straightforward, kind of who are you, what, what's been your life experience and all. But then we got to some questions that I felt like were suggestive and made some pejorative statements in, in the questions. Let's take a look at those pages. And Lonnie, tell me what you think about this. And I'm talking about question 30. Question 30 is, have you ever considered yourself a supporter of or belong to any of the following? The QAnon movement, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Boogaloo Boys, Antifa. All right. And, you know, right before that, they're asking about, you know, have you ever been involved with, followed Trump, going to any organizations about Trump? And then have you ever belonged to or been a supporter of any of these organizations? Ah... Uh, that seems to me to be pretty suggestive mm -hmm. because I think these organizations don't have the best reputation with an awful lot of people. Right. And if you're juxtaposing those with the defendant, it just seems suggestive to me. I think so. And I don't think they needed to put it in. The question before is, is quite thorough, talking about, you know, have you been involved with any Trump 
organizations or any anti-Trump organizations, then to name these specifically, it's clearly implying that there's some connection there with these groups. And I, I just don't think that's necessary. Yeah. And these questionnaires can and typically are argued by both sides with the judge and negotiated to be settled on before they go to the jury, right? Right. right. So uh, somehow this got through. You know, we don't know if it was objected to or suggested by the defense or the prosecution or whatever, but it got through. And I, I would have strongly objected to this if I'd been involved in this case on the defense side. Right. There is this major question whether the former president will take the stand. It's very unusual for a defendant to take the stand because particularly in a situation like Donald Trump, where he is known to be a terrible witness. It would just be almost inconceivable, it's somewhat suicidal actually, because it opens him up to cross-examination on everything relating to his character and truthfulness. And we know he's vulnerable in that area. Tomorrow on Dr. Phil Primetime, former President Trump's fate is in the hands of 12 regular people, the jury. Who are they and how does each one of them impact this case? Should they be sequestered? I would say yes. There's no way to get away from all of the input. As a prosecutor, would you want him to testify? Absolutely.